people who were live, you know, with a whole bunch of people. Anyway, um, yeah. good evening, everyone. And good morning, Lona. It's morning there for you. Yeah, for um, you. Um, fortunately, enough, fortunately enough. I'm getting this I'm echo, getting right, this back, echo but right back, but I'm hearing myself twice, man. Hello. You good to go. You good to go. Listen, okay, okay, okay. Okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Okay. Beth Bone Dead Zone, home is a psychodrome. Internalized hate, negativity, domestic hate, confinement rendered up beat, wonder instant horrific. Thunder distant body beat. Falling limb part, rolling rim fart, healer fingers in killer hands, all equal. Revolution of the individual, lament is gone, harm the hymn, freedom anthem. Truth is sacrifice, we feed on famine. From a quiet rest to a conscience flood, cleanse ghetto poverty with three corner blood. God. Pardon individual atrocities, cause purgatory is a mass base, SWAT commitment is penance. The game, mortality, the name, profitability. Is that going through okay? Yes, it's going well. It's going well. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, I'm I'm honored. I'm truly, really honored to to be engaging with with somebody I've loved, somebody I've cherished for the better part of my life, Lorna Goodison, who right now is Jamaica's poet laureate. Um, I don't know if one needs to point out, but she's the first woman to be. A national poet laureate in Jamaica. That's that's unfortunate, good for her, but it's unfortunate historically, of course, for the course of women. I hope we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, Lona Goodison has published numerous books. I last counted eight plus a collection of short stories, writing that's 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 crystalline, that's sharp, that cuts, that's pared down, uncluttered. Now, as we go along, of course we will keep dropping in other bits of information about the people we're talking about or the people we're talking to today, Unati Slasha and Lona Goodison. I just want to mention that in the world of letters, Lona is, is, is mentioned alongside the likes of Derek Walcott and Kamau Braithwaite. Personally, I'd have as a running mates also people like Jane Cortez and June Jordan. And these are people I've fed from personally. And we hope that in this time we're together, we'll get to hear how she got to be here so that perhaps some of us can also find a way of shaping and fashioning and uh, cutting down and forming ourselves after our own image. Okay. Um, Unatis Lasha is called in these streets some kind of um, literary thug. I'm hoping he'll tell us why that is. Slasher has ruffled a few feathers with his takes as a critical thinker, as a person who engages um, critically, intelligently also, but um, with a kid bud kind of attitude, you know, uh, trampling through the mud of uh, supposed literary legacy and shoving other people to the side because to him, they're not worth the time. Again, we get to hear from him. When I met him the first time some years ago, Unatis Lasha was, was an MC. He was some kind of beast on the mic. I went to do something in Port Elizabeth at the Opera House and all the young people, all the people of his age were gathered outside. He was inside, the only person. And they told me that he was the only one they would allow to go before me because, you know, he's some kind of killer on the mic. I entered the place and he was sitting there being very serious, looking at nothing and nobody. I went up there and he wouldn't even look at me. He was so intently um, sharpened as to his goal. And he came on stage and yeah, I was quite impressed. He had blood and go and the guts of the streets of Kayamnandi where he was born. So uh, MC, poet, and a novelist now. His book, uh, Jahils, was published here by Black Ghost Books. It's been published in America also. And um, 
seems like things are going to get fire. But we'll get talking about that. At the onset, in order to lead us into our talk, I'd like to ask first Lorna as our guest to give us some kind of historical context of a writing. What was, what was happening, Lorna, when you started writing? What were the political issues that were affecting your life, the social matters, the, the literary world that existed at that time? I would assume, uh, instead of, say, Bustamante, it was the years of Siaga and Manly, um, out of which, of course, you flowered. I hope I'm not wrong, but hopefully you'll lead us through that. And also the literary aspects of that alongside it. If, if that's important, the politics of it. Can I answer you with a poem? It's called Please. Guinea Woman, and I think it sums up something of my whole career as a writer. Guinea Woman, great grandmother was a Guinea woman, wide eyes turning the corners of her face could see behind her, her cheeks dusted with a fine rash of jet bead warts that itched when the rain set up. My great-grandmother's waistline was the span of a headman's hand, slender and tall like a cane stalk, with a guinea woman's antelope quick walk. And when she paused, her gaze would look to see, her profile fine like some obverse impression on a guinea coin from royal memory. It seems her fate was anchored in that unfathomable sea, for my great-grandmother caught the eye of a sailor who ship sailed without him from Lucy Harbour. Great-grandmother's royal scent of cinnamon and scallions drew the sailor up the Straits of Africa, and the evidence is my blue-eyed grandmother, the first mulatto, taken into Bakra's household and covered with his name. And they forbade great-grandmother's guinea woman presence. They washed away her scent of cinnamon and scallions. They controlled the child's antelope walk, and they called her uprisings rebellions. But great-grandmother, I see your features, blood dark appearing in the children of each new breeding. And the high yellow-brown, it is darkening down. Listen, children, it's your great-grandmother's turn. Okay, uh, that poem sums up everything about how and why I started to write. The fact is that my history, a lot of my writing is just, you know, informed by, my, by our history and by the, the role of women and the natural role of women. And um, I always felt that women, the women in my society were brilliant, wonderful people. And they, I didn't see them anywhere in the literature, it, you know, depicted in any way that I thought was honoring them. And so in my own small way, I set out to do that. So, and I began writing from my, you know, I was a, like eight or nine, I would write little poems, but yes, you are right. I did sort of find full voice if you want during the 1970s when they, the politics were particularly, you know, tr you know, contentious and troubled. And also because of South Africa. Good morning, South Africa. Um, Jamaicans, you know, love your, South Africa is very, very close to our heart. And I became very fired up and very interested in what was happening in Southern Africa. And particularly, you know, I was captured by the idea, you know, the whole story, the Mandela's, Winnie Mandela, I've written poems to her, I've had the honor of reading one to her. And all of those things, I think, helped to shape my voice and shape my, I guess, project. Does that answer you? Hello? Am I still here? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, 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 all right. Okay. No, 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 it's the host who muted me actually anyway it answers me perfectly perfectly hopefully it, it's very important for me that you you mention uh women in this particular piece because oh. i've noticed throughout your writing the strand that is woman runs through that from i'm becoming my mother nanny to any woman you know um even the elephant poem okay it starts off elsewhere, but then ultimately it ends up being about, about that. I hope that we'll further down the line get back to that, specifically the issue of women historically and how that impacts upon your writing. You have said um, quite a bit about that. I'm hoping perhaps that we could uh, open it up somehow if, if, 
if possible. Now, um, Unati Slasher, like I said, you started out, to me anyway, I could be mistaken. You started out as a rapper, as an MC, an underground rapper, you know, with the uh, gutter stuff, with the, uh, with the gory beats, what people would call, I don't know why, dungeon, which since I met you, you've shown me that that's what you love. And I noticed that even in your novel, in your prose, not only the novel itself, but other pieces also that you've written, that there's a musicality that's carried through within there. Certain places in Giles actually could be wrapped out loud and, and laid on a drum and bass foundation, for instance. We could add some dub to that, or we could have some, some hip hop beats to carry that across. Um, what was the situation like when you started writing? What was at work? What was your, the face of your society that you tried to dig beneath to get to the core of it? Carrying, of course, all these other things you mentioned, you know, the music, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, uh... Good morning, Lord. Uh, Rams, and the host. No, Rams, as, as you said, man, you put it very well, you know, because really I started up as a rapper, you know, because trying to imitate certain guys, because there was this movement, right, in Port Elizabeth, where you go to Utnik, there was like this group of people go to, I mean, we're also doing sci fi's you know, rapping and writing rhymes, you know, creating their own you know, uh, up uh, studios in their own bedrooms, basically. That was happening in Port Elizabeth. It was in Zwede. There's a there's a whole crew, beautiful people. They only um, released one a project that is called Power Lines Project One, right? These guys, they call themselves, uh, you know, obviously following in the footsteps of uh, uh, people like, you know, the Wu-Tang Clan. They call themselves uh, Smack Lounge Camp, right? If you go to put beautiful project, by the way, and it's very rare, you can't find it. I mean, I mean even the, the son of uh, the poet, the South African poet, Mzima Oona, was involved in that. They had a beautiful, a friend of mine as well, get beautiful songs, they had different styles of approaching, you know, hip hop, different concepts, obviously. Same thing, it, it was happening, for example, in Motherwell. In Motherwell, we've got these people called the Ghetto Youth Uprising. Obviously, these guys were Hebrew, Israelite, they called themselves that. So that, like, there was this tension so that when you go to ciphers, right, people from Utnik, people from, you know, I mean, in despair, I was probably the only one, except for this other guy of mine who passed away, who was a real hip-hop head, who actually introduced me to hip-hop, right? Especially this kind of people I'm speaking about. So, like, I, I went to ciphers, you know, got inspired, you know, you know, trying to imitate this guy, like, doing my own beats at home, trying to write, trying to what, but I've discovered that, hey, man, my flow is not that well, you know, because I've heard people, like, really flow, I'm like, ah, oh, man, it's, just too much, like, I can't do that. So, like, <laughs> really, that's what it started in terms of now, like, oh, let me stop this thing because, like, I'm not really that uh, at the level of, because, like, I'm always in that mode of, or in that level of, like, comparing stuff as you would do with comparative literature. Like, same with music, I was doing that. And I've discovered, like, I'm better at writing than rapping. So, how about, you know, I take that kind of, uh, as I call it, prose flow, you know? I take that flow from rap, try to imitate that, especially in Giants, as you said, it's true. There are certain parts there that I, I like, I mean, uh, when, I, when I was writing it, like, there was a kind of, uh, in my head, you know, it was like a certain rhythm, you know, a certain rhythm, so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't really care about uh, grammar in the conventional sense, right? And create your own grammar in your head as you read. You're trying to imitate a certain type of style. So now I'm thinking, no, man, I can actually do this. Obviously inspired by other writers like yourself and others, like who kind of like you don't have to. I mean, with Tumim Khoros, for example, and uh, and this guy Utonti, uh, right? We did actually do that, you know. Even though it's a project, we don't have money to release it right now, but it's a project. You understand that we did at the Stellenbosch University, uh, the Sonic uh, residence there, where like for example, it's a beautiful project. I think, <laughs> I hope so. But yeah, we did that. So like for me, as you said. There are certain parts in, in Chinese, I mean, and they're very, like, I mean, it's in your face, like, you can see, but, like, you know, they're, sometimes they're rhyming couplets, like, you know, they like, I don't rhyme, like, like, I'm mixing it up, you know, free verse and, like, rhyming verse in the same kind of uh, 
uh, text. So yeah, man, I mean, when you speak about the music, you know, I mean, for me, it's dear to me. Like, I mean, I was like very sad, unhappy, you know, very broken hearted, you know, to have a, to have born with a voice. You can hear my voice is hoarse, man, hoarse voice. Uh, as you say, this time, it's just short, you know. So like, I, I try to do, 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 do that in my work, especially even when I'm, when I'm writing a uh, non-fiction, for example, I do, I, I do, I, I always try to put the music in the text, you know, like, put the music in the text, man, like. Oh, are you done, Slasha? Yeah, yeah. Wait, please, no, for just, now, just for now. in. Yeah. In, 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 okay, no, no, in, in, in yeah. brief. Could you tell us about the factors? Okay, I understand you're in, inspired or influenced or whatever by, by these hip hop guys. I'm just saying on the ground now, in terms of your daily life, uh, the socio political issues, did that have any impact on you? Or uh, were you just living in your own bubble, in your own mm -hmm. hip hop bubble, unaware or ignorant mm -hmm. of what else was happening? You know, I, I, I just want to know what influence, what, what does it work? At the writing, the genesis. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's all history. Very briefly, so we can get back to mm. Yeah, especially in Kayam Nandi, right? I mean, people who speak, for example, about the Nyanga massacre and whatnot, but when I came to writing, right, because I, I, I mean, I grew up in a place of, I mean, uh, my grandmother is a great storyteller, like, right, you know, really now I think so, like, you know, and all the time, you know, when you wake up in, because I, I'm thinking about this idea. Speaking back to what you just said now about this idea of, 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 of poop, I wish to dream or a tongue or those things. Because, like, when I was growing up, my grandmother would wake up early in the morning, waking up everybody, you know, and relate or kind of, you know, narrate the dream, a tongue, understand, which is like a, a completely different uh, concept compared to what we usually know as a dream. Because, like, a tongue, or like, as we, our mother has, has, has told us, um, in, a, in a beautiful uh, thesis on, on uh, you know, on is significant uh, rituals and whatnot, yeah. She, she broke it down beautifully there. So, like, that in itself, you know, like, it got me into writing, to be honest, like, really, now beyond the hip-hop now, I mean, before the hip-hop, right, that in itself, the kind of, uh, you know, the storytelling, the way you would tell stories. But obviously, that's what I'm saying, you go to the shippings, you go to the taverns, you meet people, old people especially, telling you stories that you didn't know. That actually, there are these kind of stories here, and no one is telling these stories. And where now you can rap most. Like, people are always sitting in my township, this uh, poet where I rap. Why are you not talking about these things? Obviously, when you're telling a story or you're speaking about a certain event, which is always, always criticized in most South African fiction, you know, it's, it's fine to kind of speak about a certain or a particular you know, historical events, like what, what they call now in, uh, in the very umbrella word, uh, you know, historical fiction or whatnot. It's good to, to have that, but for me, it's the, the point is always to kind of not only exaggerate, but to kind of imagine beyond the event, you know, to speak to something completely different from the event, to actually challenge, you know, what has been inherited, you know, in terms of whether you've heard this thing, whether it's written down in documents, because like, People on the streets tell a different story about the same event. We've, we've seen this in the case of Nung Nausa, where like there are different accounts. Mm. Not all of them add up, obviously. But so like for me, the writing, okay. of, of course, that, that that in itself is, 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 is political to think like that. Because now I'm trying to think of politics beyond the party and the whatnot. No, you know, talking about the, the everyday people, you know, without you know the whole vulgarity, you know, the, the whole violence. I mean, we, this is common everywhere, especially in the townships. For me, like, I want always to imagine beyond that. So, like, for me, writing came in that, and it helped me kind of assess certain things, you know, certain events. I mean, in the, even in Chai Hills, when you read there, like, there is kind of a certain actual... I mean, I use actual people's names, people who actually live in my township, people who are very interesting characters in the township. Like, when you go to Jai and then you encounter this guy, uh, this old man called Pungamans, that was his real name. You know, he was living here on my street. But what I tried to do is to kind of not talk about his life. Only took the name and then like create a character, you know, that is entirely different 
even though there are certain aspects that you could say, like people would tell, hey man, in that story of yours, you're speaking about Uman, you're speaking about this person, and they will laugh at it, you know. I'm not sure if I, I try to respond. I try to respond to you, Rams. That I, I tried my best. <laughs> not for I know you know you covered it, man. Um, we just got into specificities, which I thought well, perhaps we could, could build on as we as we go along. Very important issues that you raise, the issue of music, etc. Um, everyone watching this could hear the musicality. In, in, in Lorna's writing, you know, without her waving a flag like, hey, hear the music in this thing, it is there. It's very important. Um, and people don't realize that in this country, it is not necessarily the people who get published in magazines or who go and, uh, and do these spoken word things, etc., who are poets. In, in, for, for example, Maskandi music, right? The guy goes in there, starts singing, starts singing, and in the middle of it, breaks into this rap uh, patterned manner in which he praises himself or talks about social ills, etc., and then gets back into the music. That we saw also in Jamaica, you know, with the reggae DJs, Big Youth, Iroy, Uroy, you know, Dennis Al Capone, etc. Now, that I, I hope we can speak about at some point down the line. I want to hear from Lona. I mean, after all, Lee Scratch Perry said that um, when the slavers came to Africa, they stole only the superstars. So only the superstars ended up in Jamaica. You know, I'm not going to argue with that. It's it's quite a, a cool thesis. Anyway, um, Lona, please could you help me out here with tracing the lineage what what brought you here i mean um uh, what you fed off in terms of of right the act of creation i guess it doesn't guess only, it doesn't have, to only be have to be things that were on the page that you were reading there were obviously other people that somehow inspired you i don't know if you feel comfortable with the word influence i personally don't um I, I draw inspiration from other people around me. So if you could guide us down there, because you have yourself inspired a generation. Well, maybe two. I know me, for one. You know. Um, so what came so before what you? What came before you? Well, thanks. First of all, I, I forgive my bad manners. Again, I should have greeted everybody formally, but I'm just so happy to be here this morning with you. But um, to get to your question, I'm very fortunate to have, I'm the eighth of nine children. I have eight siblings <clears throat> and they're all very interesting people. My, my sister Barbara, the eldest is a journalist. So I actually grew up in a house where there was a writer, where somebody who actually, she went to the, the, to the newspaper and wrote for a living. So I knew you could do that. And all my brothers are in some way or the other connected with Jamaican music. Two of them worked for um, Cox and Dodd, you know, Sir Coxon's Downbeat was one of the main, you know, shapers of Jamaican, modern Jamaican music. And so my house was a very interesting place. We didn't, we weren't, we didn't have money, but we were, we were well enough off so that we had a big enough place where people would come and <clears throat> I would grow up seeing, for example, members of the Scatterlights, the great Jamaican folk band, like Tommy McCook and Roland Alfonso coming through our house. So I was very conscious of the making of modern Jamaican music. Also, my brothers like jazz. So I grew up listening to a lot of jazz. My son's name is Miles and I call, <laughs> I call him Miles, obviously after Miles Davis, because I am from, the, you know, I was, I just was steeped in that music, jazz and, um, rhythm and blues and modern Jamaican music because I actually met some of the people who made it. So all of, so between the fact that I, my sister's a journalist and engaged in create, you know, working at the newspaper, I was very, you know, conscious of, you know, socially, you know, issues, any kind of, we're very, for example, when I was growing up, we were very caught up with the idea of Jamaica gaining independence. 
as a small child, you know, <clears throat> you know, we were thinking, you know, we really should be independent from England. So all of these things were in the air, in the culture in which I grew up. So I have to credit all of that for in the ways in which it shaped my voice. And then there was the, the good old, the good colonial education, or as Derek Walcott called it, a sound colonial education. And what they gave us, of course, were all these texts which we then had to examine and reject. But lots of romantic poets like William Wordsworth, people like that. But we also, I also was very fortunate again in that as part of my growing up, I grew up in the city of Kingston. And I am a town child, so I, I went to the movies a lot and I went to live concerts, lots of live concerts. So I saw the performance aspect of things, you know, that people could come onto a stage and deliver and change the audience's mind and the audience would respond in this way or that. And so I suspect that all of this was being sort of, you know, I, I was taking it on board. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I didn't know I wanted to be a writer. I was a painter. I always, I, I trained as a painter in Jamaica and New York, but, um, but I always wrote, but I thought I would do that privately. But somehow one day the two things came together because I like to think I'm very much thinking a lot about the visual arts when I write. I like to paint, you know, I paint words. I like to present an image. I like, I like when people say my, paint, my poems are painterly. I think it's a very high compliment when I'm told that my paintings are, my poems are painterly. So all of these things feed my work. And um, also I became, I'm also very interested in religion. I don't mean it in, in just the sort of, my, my, pe my people were Anglican. My mother was very high Anglican. But the language of the, the, the liturgy is also very important to my work because I like to think sometimes that that's what I'm doing, creating different kinds of liturgy for more appropriate to my culture and my people and to the, and to the condition of women. I have a very long poem, for example, called The Banishment of the King of Swords. And that is an attempt to create some sort of ceremonial banishment of, of a figure or ways in ways that are harmful to one and all of that would have come from going to church and reading the liturgy and reciting the liturgy and all of these things i think penetrated and percolated and found a way into my voice and i think if i can explain my voice at all that is as much as i can say about how it came about and then also i just want to say this there is mystery there's a big difference between magic and mystery. Magic, magic involves some form of manipulation, but mystery raises questions. And when you get that question, there's another question, and question after question after question. And I am very comfortable, or I've become at this late stage of my life, very comfortable with mystery. There are some things that you cannot explain. <laughs> and there's an aspect of what I do that I cannot explain. Beautiful. Thank you very much for that. You raise very important issues. I, I'm, I'm hoping that while I yap a little bit now, uh, I'll be giving Slash uh, a chance to put his thoughts together based off what you've just said now, particularly the issue of magic and mystery and things attached, because that is what is central to his writing also the other well he's got this concept of writing the unlanguaged i hope you'll tell us a little bit about that to pick up on what you just said for me personally the cinema um i grew up in a house where reading was not at all encouraged i, I was i actually had a um a, a wicked you see now technology i i, I had a witch of an aunt who was of, of the idea that, that books bred cockroaches and rats, that if we kept books, we would be overrun by vermin, et cetera. So she took every single book she could find and threw it out in the garden. Anyway, that's for another day. So I spent almost every single weekend of my life at the cinema, A Twin Soweto. That was a major factor in my writing. But then also, in terms of music, for example, the Sotho people, there's something called farm, 
which again, like like the Zulu Maskand, is poetry that's carried through song and chant, and they rap onto the beat. In Botswana, there's an old man called Razia Sitkaku who used to play this bow instrument, you know, a one string instrument with a little, a bit of a calabash here, yeah, and he hit it with a stick and recite poetry on top of that. My thesis is if you were to take that music of his away, just have him chanting and put a dub track on there, he would be Uroy or one of the um, reggae DJs. That inspired me quite a lot also. As for painting, um, we could point at people like Figile Makalela, who created fictions um, and histories actually, attempted to capture our histories on a canvas. Figile Makalela, Dumile Feni, you know, Lifi Fitlari, the list is quite long. So uh, I, actually have tried to, to become a Johnny Johnny of, of the Blue Notes, a Johnny Johnny note throughout everything I've written. So music is quite central to that also. Um, I do know, for example, that, that Louis Bennett, Miss Lou, who um, the dub poets, even though some of them don't regard themselves as that, Linton Kwesi Johnson, Muta Baruka, Jane Binterbreeze, and Michael Smith, credit her with having somewhat handed down a voice to them that they then developed and did what they did. Now, Slasher, having listened to all of this, what was central to your writing, particularly the magic and mystery bit? And also the music, you spoke about hip hop, but that's a form, that's, that's, that's not what we're talking about now. But I'm saying the musicality that's to be found within your own writing. Where was that suckled to you? And how does magic and or mystery factor in your own work? Oh, well, thank you for that. Uh, and also thank you, uh, Sister Mordor. For you, especially for you mentioning that religion, magic, and then you know mystery as well, because I'm fascinated by those things. Because I grew up, I grew up Adventist, by the way. So like there was always, uh, you know, a church reading. I mean, my grandfather, for example, had a suitcase, you know, a black suitcase. Like you cannot touch it. I mean, I was very young then, sleeping on the couch, so that at night, while I was asleep, I would sneak into his room while I was asleep and go to a like. To that, to that uh, suitcase, obviously, and read those books that are there. Like so, like I grew up like that, you know, like reading LNG White and whatnot in translation, it's a cause. But also, uh, speaking about the music and and whatnot, uh, I'm trapped between two shipins. There are three now, by the way. I mean, I mean this 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 guy who was smart, who, who, but he passed away a long time ago. You own this one here, yeah, right? He always played music. There was no DJ, like there was a DJ. No, there's no DJ. He's playing music. He's the one who's playing the music all the time. So he's buying CDs all the time, like the new music in town. So I'm trapped in this place like that. So like when I'm sleeping at night, I could hear the noise. I could hear the music. Sometimes I wake up, I go down, you know, without even having money to buy a I'm just sitting there listening to the music. So I grew up in a space like that. Also, speaking back to the idea of magic, I understand. It's a cause. Uh, there's a beautiful word. Um, we, it's cause. I, I like it. Those words is cause because it, I mean, it captures what I'm trying to do in my own writing. But there's this idea, you you know, it depends on some people pronounce it, which like means that is uh, there are two ways to it, right? You understand? It's like and meaning that like it's a science, like. One chooses, and then now this idea of magic, now speaking about that, like you either choose to be a witch or a witch, what do you, what do you call a witch doctor? Like that's, a mo that's the most basic way to put it because like there is no kind of direct uh, translation that captures it in English. So basically what I'm trying to do in my own way, right? Speaking about magic, I'm always trying to, especially because I'm, I mean, really I love it in so many. And I'm, I'm, I'm always saying, right? When speaking about it, the idea of the folk tale or what we call in Somi, is that in Somi doesn't have to 
it doesn't have to be a certain length, you know, like of I this one should be short, should be low. No, actually, like people like for example in South Africa, even though a lot of people do not want to read the work, want, I mean, a, she's very understudy, but for me, she's very important in terms of her ideas. You understand? Like people like Nongi uh, the Master you know, from the Trans Sky, you know, a guy called Harold Shu put up some books together because she, she, she I mean, who, who, who in the world, who narrates a 150 hour long tale that she, she that she only heard once in her life when she was nine years old and she still remembers it because she's, she's had a beautiful uh, way of speaking when, when she's theorizing about her work, right? I mean, it's a course, but now this guy translated this thing into English uh, in, in the book called The World and the Word, you know? She, she says, like, one must pick a certain aesthetic, uh, you know, point there, a stylistic device there. And you basically her way of storytelling is very eclectic, right? So, like, these are the people, right? For me, like they should be over the forefront. People were like we should be learning from. I mean, in Nigeria, the same thing happened uh, with Aimu Sudwa in 1952 with his uh, the palm wine drinker. He did exactly that. So, like now in, in South Africa, now for example, I mean, speaking back to this idea of magic, you know, and the mystery. I mean, it's, it's from religion, from my from my place. Was but I always wanted to know, you know, always had this like I always I was always questioning, even in, in the church, I'm always questioning. You know, at some point I got kicked out, you know, <laughs> because like, you know, you shouldn't ask those questions. You know, those those are the, those are the questions that actually fascinate me. Those are the questions that I think, uh, you know, South African writing should be, you know, concerned with. Especially that, you know, feeding off, you know, uh, you know, our own indigenous ways of storytelling. We're not saying you must replicate the form or the formula or, of, or the pattern of Insomi. Insomi can always be rearranged because in Somi, you know, this idea of Ubun Somi, you know, I mean, in the Shibin, man, they're all, people are always saying in Somi, even they are short, sometimes a paragraph, if you put it on the page, you know. So, like, I hope I try to answer you there. But I'm, I wasn't trying to remember something you asked earlier on. Eh? I'm very long, I forget very quick these days. I'm getting old. You see, at least I tried here to, you know, I actually tried here. At, at the back to stay away from the cliche appearance of talking to people and having books in the background. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm behind, I mean, the, the wardrobe now. <laughs> the wardrobe is behind me, by the way. Hey, this English thing is very terrible. All right. Um, All right. Um, very, very interesting things. Here. And, and please, please, uh, to both of you, should we have missed maybe, a, forgotten, maybe a forgotten, point forgotten a point that we raised? That we raised and you feel that you feel that that you please feel free to do so. Because I think, because so I think far, so we've packed quite, far, a, we've lot packed into quite this, a lot that, into this. That, if we had a if marathon, we had a marathon question, question, we could really do justice to it. But the, the, the issue of women, for example, Slasha, I, I, I can say, I can not speaking for, for him, that, that his, his grandmother and his mother are the most important people in his life, and his literary mother, the one he's just spoken about, uh, Mazenani, played a very, very pivotal role in what he ended up becoming. And like I said, Lona, in your writing, even when the woman is not mentioned, no woman is mentioned, it's alive there on the page. One can sense that, one can feel it. Because your writing is, is really stripped down, very crystalline, one could say, you know. And it hits beyond the words themselves on the page, which is, which, which is what I love. I'm hoping we, we can get back to these things if either one of you feels up to it. Okay. Uh, the Caribbean has impacted upon the world quite a lot. You know, I'm talking now about about the Greater Caribbean. You know, not just Jamaica. You know, we had a, a lovely. We 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 had uh, quite a number of people. We've, we've mentioned them now. I mean, um, Martini gave us Cezanne, Fanon. We could go. You know, we could we could even go to Belize. Go wherever. Uh, even in terms of music, the mighty Sparrow, Trinidad, etc. 
But when one speaks about Jamaica, and it's been said, I haven't actually proved this to be a fact, but I, I, I think it is, that out of all the countries in the world, Jamaica was the one that was focused the most on the plight of black South Africans in this country throughout the apartheid struggle. Okay, um, I'm a serious reggae lover. I, I won't get into the other aspects of it, just talking about the music. I mentioned Lee Perry also. Um, we could talk about King Tabby's. Those people, in terms of what they did with music, affected how popular music was going to be engineered. In whatever form, it doesn't matter whether it's rock music, punk, whatever. It All of it stems from what they do with, with dub music. So my question would be this, that and maybe it's an unfair it's question an, to ask of any single of person. Any on single earth. person on earth. But what would you attribute? But what would you attribute? Such a major, such a major that it, that tiny island had on the world, compared to you know these massive states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jamaica has impacted upon the world completely beyond compare, really. What, what, would, what do we say? I, I, I was watching a documentary on dub music. Someone was asking, is it the Safaration? Is it the ganja? Is it, you know, people come with all sorts of ridiculous theories, of course. But I'm just saying to you, you could even make it a throwaway thing. Because like I said, it's not fair to ask anybody to say, you know, anyway. Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay, can, is this good? All right, um, I know those, first of all, I, I have no explanation for just how much the people of Jamaica were almost with, without exception. They have had a burden placed on their hearts for the, for the plight of their South African brothers and sisters. I mean, you would see as a people we were one, Jamaica was one of the first signatories to any attempt to embargo, you know, embargo goods against South Africa. I think we, some say we were the first, but we, we always felt this great need to just be with you. We, 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 felt, we, we felt your pain the entire time. We never dropped the ball, we were always just there. And I, 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 I wish I could explain it again, and maybe I could put it down to magic and mystery, but I think I wanna say something here about Rastafari. You cannot speak about any of the things you have spoken about, about dub poetry, about reggae music, about without the spirit of Rastafari. Had you not had Marcus Garvey and ju just the, the early Rastafari and brethren who just basically, and they've helped the entire world, especially, you know, Bob Marley used to say in his, his enigmatic, wonderful way, Rasta will rule the world and people would laugh. But in a way, he wasn't wrong because that kind of thinking where you don't make any accommodation with the enemy, you make no accommodation with the person who is intent on degrading you and reducing you and vanquishing you. They just, they just knew from early that there was no way to make appeasement with this. The only way to deal with it is to just completely have nothing to do with it and to turn it upside down. So the way language and the importance of what Rastafari has given to poetry and modern poetry, the way they would subvert the English language, you know, the Rastafarians would say, for example, like, uh, one of my, is like, you know, down pressure instead of oppression. Because if somebody is oppressing you, they can't, they can't be put it, it's not up, it's not an upward movement. So simple things like that planted seeds in the minds of succeeding generations that you just don't accept this. Don't accept a man telling you that this is oppression when it's down pressure. You know, things like that. And um, my favorite is a, is a free nana as opposed to a banana. Because <laughs> you shouldn't ban anything. I mean, they're all sorts of, they're funny too, very funny. So you have to talk about Rastafari and Marcus Garvey. And all of those elders, those people who paved the way for us. And there would have been a lot, been a lot of women, the women in there, from Nanny of the Maroons, to, all, to, 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 to just people I know, just women who just refuse to accept what was, given, what was being given to us. 
you know, as you know, this, as our colonial heritage and our legacy, that if we behaved ourselves and we spoke properly and we looked a certain way, they would accept us. And Rasta said, no, they're not going to accept you. Have nothing to do with it. And so I think that spirit, that spirit of, you know, right now I hear they're pushing, you know, everybody's saying repatriation, reparations has become a big issue, like in, in Jamaica. And people, yes, we, Rastafari, they were saying that forever. You know, that was an, that we, we are owed. You took us and you worked us and you gave us nothing and we oppressed us and, and you destroyed our lives. You owe us. When Rastafari was, was, you know, clamoring for reparations, people just thought they were making trouble. So all of what you said, and I, I'm very glad you brought out the th things like, you know, King Toby and, um, King, you know, um, Lee Scratch Perry and P. These people are in any other, I notice in your, in parts of Europe, they are regarded as geniuses. I mean, Scratch Perry is, a, is, a, is an extraordinary mind that that man has. And a lot of these people were the early, they, they, I'm not going to say they invented, but electronic music. That is, you know, they had, they were, as you say, in their little, in their bedroom and in their mother's bathrooms, were creating these things. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm answering all you want to say you know you've asked me list but um yes i couldn't be the only problem i couldn't be a rastafarian because i'm too rebellious a woman and women in rastafari <laughs> but everything else about it yes but i am not a rasta woman there's no way i'm walking behind any man <laughs> okay oh beautiful beautiful well, you know, this, this is my daily life, engaging with what we've spoken about there. I mean, um, in terms of, of the music, for, for example, toasting, what now people refer to as dancehall, even though the old guys, uh, dancehall was a place, but now it seems like it's become a form, you know? Let's leave it. That's that's for another day. I mean, we had we had Sister Nancy, for example. You know, Sister Anne, and on the poetry side, Jean Binta Breeze. We we could go on. Um, Slasher, could couldn't you read something for us now, man? You know, to keep the spirit going. First of all, one full one, but Rastafari, hey, I'm always fighting with these guys here, uh, the Rastas, and you know, I love them. I always go to their shelter, so I'm always fighting with them in terms of the definition of being a Rasta. Because, and in my defense, they say, Hi, you can't be Rasta, you you like this thing, you know. And then, and then, you know, I'm I always, I'm always quoting uh, uh, our father, Benning Spear, in this song that he says. One of his beautiful lines that uh, Malcolm X was a Rasta man. Malcolm X wasn't a Rasta man in the true sense. Marcus Garvey was a Rasta man. Martin Luther King was a Rasta man. I mean, these different people are now like one was a Christian, one was a, a, a Muslim, the other was none. So, like, what is the definition of being a Rasta? Of like, you know, trying to keep certain others. That's beyond that. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for that, man. Yeah, I'm gonna read something here from a uh, very short thing. Uh, you right. Uh, from the next year, actually, this book was, I mean, was, it's been sitting here for like uh, more than five years. No one was to publish it. Uh, it was written a long time. Uh, it's called The Bad Place of the Sun, right? And now I'm, I'm reading an extract now called Bodies and Baboons. Tightly enclosed the corpses in a black refuse bag. A wheelbarrow them to bury them in the nearby dumping site. Dogs aren't human beings. They are animals. And animals don't deserve to be buried with dignity. I've never imagined a dog's funeral. Who would attend a dog's funeral? Being a dog is but being a flea or an ant or a roach. Their deaths have no impact under the sun. During my random ruminations, I often find myself agreeing with that French fellow who said, dogs are but soulless things. Next moment, I'm rejecting that bullshit notion and condemning my mind for being so fickle. There are minor yet striking similarities between dogs and men. They both spring out of a bloody womb. Men and dogs breathe the same filthy air. Men are probably the only creatures that are unapologetically discriminatory, yet like dogs, they all end up rotting inside the soil. 
if grandpa was alive, he would want me to bury these dead dolls as I am doing, as I've always done. He plays value in animals, how he hated crazy taxi truck drivers who very often, out of their indifference for animals, ran over cats and dogs on the streets, left blood splattered all over the tarred road, bloody heartless bastards, Grandpa would yell from his wheelchair, brandishing his old copy, but the drivers, absorbed in the far distance of the road, never stopped. Owners of the casualties were left to bury their pets alone, to dig the hole, plunge the shovel into the soil, scoop shovel earth out numerous times, like I'm doing, like I've always done. At times, the owners would turn their heads, snap the stench, refuse to take responsibility for their dead pets. I can't understand what is so degrading about burying your own, cleaning up their blood and picking up their fractures, digging holes into which to dump them. The exertion certain owners lacked, and Grandpa would say, indifferent people like these don't deserve to own any pets. It's hard to breathe. The air is acrid. It burns my nostrils and my head spins all the more because I can't stop thinking about grandmother sharing a death day with her favorite dogs. Soil, sun scorched, pushed, breathe a stale stench and the heat suffocates and sweats the insides of my shoes. And I feel my toes turning sticky and itchy as I near the dumping site. Even the bodies are beginning to stink in the sun, attracting a black cloud of flies as I drive the Kiriva through the road streets, narrow streets, feeling squeamish. Strike the shovel into the soil, scoop and shovel it out, do so numerous times, tired, stop and drop the shovel. By the tail, I hold the body of one of my disemboweled dogs without legs and head in the sky before dumping it into a hole. Draw a floaty globe of flame and spit it out, and it flees and sticks atop the hill of rubbish next to me. That gob comes from the depths of my nauseated life. I don't scrap it. I don't scrap or cover it. I leave it for the famished flies that have been humming around since I arrived. At least I don't vomit this time. Last time I buried a dog, one that belonged to an old man that used to live next door to grandmother's house. I vomited. Old man was sick and had a cholera. He seemed untouched by the news of the death of his dog. He repeated every sentence I said that irritated me. And I stormed out of his house, hailing insult about crazy and useless old people. It's my grandpa who placated and told me of the man's sickness and begged me to bury the sickest pet. His dog is inside. His dog's insides were strewn all over the road like big worms, small as insects waiting to be picked on by starving ibises. Head cried so that his bloody eyeballs were bulging, dangling outside the sockets, and crimson tongue sandwiched between its tightened and hard pressed jaws. Dog messed up the place with this soupy shit that contaminated the whole street with his putty Greek. I immediately rushed out my breakfast. I vomited. As I clean up its mess, vomited. As I gather its blood and cut trench pieces and enclose them in a refuse bag, vomited. As I carry it to the dumping site, I vomited. As I dug the hole, as I buried the dog while his echolytic sicko was snoring somewhere in his house, while some soothing music on the radio sounded, and the taxi that ran over the poor animal was long gone. Nobody could have done anything about it because we all fear taxi drivers. Like this. Unmute, please. All right. Thank you. No, thanks, Dash. Um, no, no, if, if, if you want to respond to that little bit of, of, of reading, please do so. Um, but I just want to start off by by saying this one thing, language, language as, as a tool, it's been used as a tool for the oppression of people throughout history. On the other hand, language has been used as a liberatory force. Okay. You've been credited as not necessarily working against 
the canon we all of course spring out of this huge thing into which we are supposed to to uh, stick ourselves to be accepted as writers as poets etc but you've done things even within this language of the master that that other people couldn't do by the way i hope they give you that nobel even though we are first to say to hell with these things but hey it would be a fine gesture it'd be the first time i you know i know and well okay let's leave that um what i'm trying to say is language as as a breathing entity as something that 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 walks with us as beyond just it being a vehicle for the transmission of our culture of our being as people language is itself a living breathing living being which envelops us okay it serves just beyond communication i hope you all agree with that the things you've done with language you know some people i've heard them saying that um they are being subversive that they are experimenting with form that they are experimental when what they actually mean is that they don't know what they are doing okay so if you challenge them say no nah, this is an experimental piece you wouldn't understand it it's crap we can see that it's crap but okay that's not the point or on now i'm saying um did you take did you take uh, a stand did you decide to to work away from received um knowledge handed down images within the canon let's put it that way that everybody has sucked from and did that have to do with where you actually sprang from or was it an individual thing because i respect individuality i have zero respect for individualism some people can't make out the difference but anyway i, I hope my question was clear so far um All right. First of all, Unathi, thanks for that poem. I just want to comment on your deep empathy, your feeling for all living things. That's what I got from that. And um, that's a very necessary way to, to, to be thinking and feeling in this time. You know, just so, so thank you very much for that. It was really, it gave me a lot to think about it. it, it it had a lot of surprises and it had a lot of things to shock, you know? So, so thank you for that. It gave me a lot to think about. All right. Okay. I'm going to try and remember what you asked me there about language. I spent a lot of time on my, my work. It might not, I mean, I've written quite a lot, so it looks as it, maybe it looks as if I don't, but I spent an enormous amount of time right on my revisions and working on my work. I was very, I think my very first, collection of poetry is called Tamarind Season. And when I look back at it now, when I, if, when I go back to it, I just, it was just this sort of, I think Rabindranath Tagore was one of, the po one of the poets I love, that great Bengali poet. And I found his work when I was very young, I was a teenager and I, I just loved his poems. Um, well, the, the translations I read of his poems, but he, I read somewhere where he said that you are very early poems usually come as a result of being broken in some way. So there's a kind of crying out quality to them. And if you look at your early poems, I think that's usually quite true. But my early poems had that crying out quality up, up to them. And I wasn't consciously doing some things that I think I'm doing now, which is to look at the English language and see how I can make it work for me as a Jamaican. So in almost every poem I have, some sort of signature where I'm, I'm making standard English function as Creole. So if you, by virtue of a, a line break or just somehow, it's, you know, like I was thinking about a line I wrote the other day where it, I was speaking to this, this guy who was a stowaway from, from somewhere in Africa, from Senegal, I think. And I met him in, 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 in Spain, in, or in Portugal. And, 
<clears throat> it says something like his wife, she like him is from Senegal. But if you're Jamaican and you say, because where, where the line breaks, you say his wife, she like him, you know, which means she likes him as opposed to, you know, she like him, you know, but just things like that. And may not seem like a big thing, but it is to me that it gives me some agency which is something that we're all after as artists and human beings. There's so, that, that, that was what was so criminal and unspeakable about slavery, about plantation slavery, that people were robbed you know, of, of agency to the extent that you couldn't decide whether you could keep your child or you could have your own name. So any attempt to pull back some sort of agency is, is very important for us. And, um, I love working and I love the full range. I love working with every the English language in every way, you know? So um, my mother's English, which very much is, influences the way I write, was, I think they would describe it in, you know, academics would say it was Elizabethan, in that the influences were from everywhere and there were new words coming in all the time. But she would, she would speak very high, very formal English and then right after that, somewhere like really what they were called, basilist, basilectic, patwa. So it was all in there, and, but that is, our, that is how we are. And I love doing that. Also, very importantly, I was again very blessed to be close to Louise Bennett. I actually lived in one of her houses for a long time. And I, I listened to her and, I, and everything that, everything that has been given to Louise Bennett now by way of honors is absolutely overdue and right. She staged talk about a warrior woman. She stood up against the establishment. She got a very hard time in her life. You know, people were accusing her of corrupting the morals of the Jamaican youth by making them respect Patwa. People really gave her a hard time and she just stood firm and she just said no. And you know why? <clears throat> she told me that as a child, her mother, like my mother was a dressmaker. And she would hear all these women and these people coming into her mother's house, waiting on their clothes while she saw them. And she said she just loved these people. She thought, what good people. And so when people were telling her that Pato was bad, in her mind, she said, these are good people, so the way they speak can't be bad. And it was as simple as that. She made up her mind that she was going to defend the way these people spoke because they were good people. And it's things that, that, that inform us and form our voices, if we think about it carefully. It's not so much high theory or things like that. It's usually something as beautiful and as small and as what Rasta called truth and right, that is, you know, f perform, it is a sort of, gives us the impetus to do the things we do and write the way we write and speak the way we speak. And does that answer your Lusego? Is that okay? Absolutely. I'm really, really um, grateful, actually. I'm blessed for how you, you, you put it down. You know, um, talking about your mom, for example, here in South Africa, when I was drag kicking to church dressed in a monkey suit and a tie, you know, my grandmother would have me stand there, you know, parade in my little suit and say to me, I'll translate, and say to me, yes, I'm weak after. A legnet was King George. Okay, in translation, he'd say, you're such a, a beautiful gaffer. Okay, some people say nigger, but gaffer, okay, derogatory term, South Africa. You're such a beautiful gaffer, you look just like King George. I don't know if that meant she was a crazy to her oppression or what, but for her, that was a compliment. And then you've got old people yeah, old men who dress up in every, every day in jacket and tie, shiny shoes, looking very, very handsome. You know, I mean, they are little English gentlemen lost in the streets of Soweto, you know, and they brag about how they had what was called royal education, which speaks to what, what, what you've just been saying about, about your mom. Maybe it was worldwide, I know it happened here, you know. And there are these old people whose use of the English language is so polished. They're such cultured people, etc. 
And then we've got we've got the flip side of that. People like Slasher. There are there are a few, unfortunately, just a few young people of his generation who are attempting to go against the grain in that way in an intelligent manner, you know. Um, so I, I hope. I think we've run out of time. We're supposed to to spend 45 minutes here, and I see we're running at one hour, 20 minutes. I don't know if we could go on for another five or so minutes. But I hope in that time you could read to us maybe, I don't, I don't know, Nanny, or, or not to put any pressure on me, maybe Nanny, or I'm becoming my mother, my favorite pieces so far. Um, yeah, if you've got them now. Otherwise, I'll ask Slasha a question while you sort yourself out. Slasha. Could you break down the state of South African writing at the moment, as you see it? Yes, I didn't get a question. Can't hear you. Look, okay. There are a few people who've come out um, celebrating your take, particularly that essay of yours that was so polarizing. There are people who thought that a great, great, great essay, da, 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 and some people who knocked you for it. I'm not saying let's go back to that essay. My question to you is, what could you tell us in as brief a manner as possible about the state of South African writing? If you want to be historical with it, that's cool. You can take it from before, you started writing, what influenced, what inspired you, etc., and how you see people dealing with the word right now. What's your take? I mean, in other words, is the future looking very bright for South African literature, according to you? Okay, hey, Rams. Uh... You know, we, we, we spoke about the, the, you know, the language, and you know, I mean, earlier on, we spoke about the Rastafari road, you know, and, and their, you know, connection with the idea of sub, 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 subverting the language. Which now, uh, for me, talking about South Africa now, right? And I'm trying to think now, for example, of people like Isabella Matutinyane, Aiko Hila, I'm trying to think of Sekama Mutsapi, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, uh, Sapamla as well, you know, like, I mean, Sapamla does that very well, I mean, in, in his writings, I mean, especially in that one poem about the statement, the torture, you know, it's, it's a common thing. Every, go to the township, that's how people speak. I mean, Rem spoke about this other time in one of his interviews about the idea of the thematic, you know, like, of like, trying to make the writing speak the voice, in the voices of the land. Now, there is no future of South African literature if, for example, we are not focused on the poetics. Because a lot of people, they don't like to talk about the poetics. I mean, Louis Ngozi came out knocking uh, Umotobi at some point in his beautiful essay, where, where I mean, saying that this guy is completely averse to theory. In th speaking about theory now, in, in, in the, the literary sense of it, you know, about poetics, about aesthetics, people use those words interchangeably. So uh, if there is no idea of that in South Africa, if we keep on repeating what has already been inherited, I mean, what we inherited has already been done, we always have to have a poetics. I mean, people like, I mean, everywhere people have been doing that. You know, Ike Mugila, even in one of his interviews, he does break it down, his idea of his terms and whatnot. And uh, it's not about explaining how you write. It's just saying that, because I mean, uh, one of his father, I like a lot, Nathan Mack is in, you know, one of his essay, he's speaking about, people always speak about experimentalism or experimenta experimentation or innovative. Innovative as opposed to what? Because if you, if you're speaking, for example, about an experiment or an innovative piece of writing, you would have to know, when, like, what was there already? You know, what, what has been happening? How are people writing? What are the poetics of the time? I mean, James Joyce came out at some point, you know, speaking against uh, 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 realism. Uh, I mean, I mean, the ro romanticism, saying no. Actually, like now, we need, you know, to come up with a kind of a release. I'm a, a popular, was speaking about the idea of visceral realism. There's always been poetics in li in literature, like without them, like you're, you're just walking around, uh, 
as, as you said, Rams, like people who say like they are doing something entirely new, but these people like you don't know what they're doing. They say it's an experiment because there's no poetics involved. That's why I came with this idea, you know, when I was studying at Rhodes, uh, you know, 2016 and whatnot, uh, of the unlanguage. You know, what I was trying to say, but I was, you know, the small essay I wrote about, because where I live, right, there's this a kind of, you know, that of magic or mystery and whatnot, of mythology even. Now, we don't speak about the township. Now, there's a lot of township myths and superstitions, you know, about certain things. You can't do this because of that. So, obviously, like, I came to study there and then trying to kind of create a certain way of, like, speaking about that reality. You know, create, trying to create the mythopoetics, I can put it that way. And I tried my best to do that. Basically, when I was doing that, I was trying to say, like, we cannot just write. You know, one has to know the literary genealogy. One has to know the literary history. One has to kind of try to formulate a way of looking, not only at you know, on literature, literature, but also at the world, you know, creating, a, 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 I mean, self-poetic, poetics, if you could call it that. I mean, musicians always do that. Now I'm trying to think of Drexia now, which uh, Koto Shan wrote about in this beautiful book, More in the Sun, about how these guys, like, even though they were making, you know, this, this, this sound, always in the, in the sleeve, you know, the covers, there's always a mythopoetic there about what is Drexia and what's going on, like, the musicians are doing it. And that's why all the literary critics all over the world, Addison Gale or whatnot, Louis Ngo in South Africa, they were always involved with the poetics. They were always saying, no, actually, like, we need to theorize. You know, and I mean, I mean Rams himself speak about uh, what he calls the sewer bound poetics, you know, and when you read his work, you actually see the sewer bound, you know, poetics, you yeah. know. Uh. Ah, okay. All right. Um, okay. I, I, I don't know what's happening. Anyway, anyway, just to, to lead into it. Thanks, thanks, Lasha, for breaking that down. Um, I don't know if, I, I do know we've run over time. I just don't know how much you could keep killing it. Because there are some people whose lives revolve around soap operas, you know, and they're say, thinking maybe, oh, they could be watching so-and-so kiss so-and-so in such a show. I don't know. If they're watching this, however, I would say I asked you to write to, to read a piece to us as, as we move towards closing this. And coming out of that, please share with us whether there is an overarching um I wouldn't say theme, whether in your writing there is something that's the driving force out of which everything else comes. If there's a, a power, if there's a center to the writing without which the entire writing falls apart, but without that, you don't exist as a writer. If that's not too up in the clouds, but please share with us the writing and we will bid everyone goodbye shortly thereafter. Where's um, was this direct, um, you want me to try to answer that, Lisego? Um, yes, but um, can I just answer with a po You asked me to read Nanny. Would that do? Okay. Um, Nanny, my womb was sealed with the molten wax of killer bees, for nothing should enter, nothing should leave. The state of perpetual siege, the condition of the warrior. From then, my whole body would quicken at the birth of every one of my people's children. I was schooled in the green giving ways of the roots and vines, made accomplice to the healing acts of cheney root, fever grass, and vervine. My breasts flattened, settled, and moving against my chest. My movements ran equal to the rhythms of the forest. When I could sense and sift the footfall of men from the animals and smell danger, death's odor in the wind's shift, and then my eyes rendered light from the dark and my battle song opened into a solitaire's moan. I became most knowing and forever alone. And when my training was over, they circled my waist in pumpkin seeds and dried okra in a traveler's jigida, 
and sold me to the traders all my weapons within me. I was sent, you tell that to history. And when your sorrow obscures the skies, other women like me will rise. That, that is why I write. I was born on the 1st of August and slavery in Jamaica, as we know, was abolished finally, finally in 1838 on the 1st of August. I do not think that is an accident. That I was born on the day, an anniversary of the emancipation of slavery means I have some burden on my heart to write about the condition of enslaved people, to humanize them, to give them voice, to do all I can to make sure that that wasn't, is never forgotten or that those who could be rescued and valorized are valorized. And that is why I write. That is the, I'm a painter by training and in painting they will always tell you that if you're doing a piece of sculpture you need an armature. Some can usually sort of a strong unmoving thing, a frame that holds up what you do. And then you build your piece of art around it, your sculpture. It is not seen, the armature is not visible when you're done, but it's in there holding up the piece. And that is my armature. That is what holds me up. Okay? That's my answer. Oh, thank you very much. Lovely, lovely, lovely answer. I think actually um, people could should, in fact, carry that away with them and try to break it down to make sense for their own existence, for the reasons why they themselves attempt to come into this world creating, whatever. Whether it's a sculpture, a painting, it doesn't really matter. But putting a stamp onto the world, we were here at some point. I hope people will do that. And on the issue, going out, the issue of, of voice, I could never mistake in your writing for that of anyone else, for example. Um, in the same way, this is my, my answer to, to people's questions about voice. In the same way that Miles Davis, now that you mention your son, respect to him. Miles Davis played an instrument that was mass produced. There were many like it. It's not like here was this trumpet that was created specifically for Miles. So he could do this thing. No, it was one of several. However, when I walk down the street and hear this one piece that I've never heard in my life before, I can easily say that is Miles Davis playing, even though I don't know that piece at all, because it's got a voice. That is what we're trying to bring to writing, because that's all we can bequeath to posterity is our voice, nothing else. Some of us, nothing else. Okay, um, I think we've overstayed our welcome. I'm particularly happy that we're here, but we're given 45 minutes. We well, we're ungovernable anyway, so we do as we please. Now, Slasher, do, do do you have any final words for our people? You know, I mean, yeah, you're speaking about voice, right? And I mean, when you, I mean, they always say this thing. I mean, I'm reading this other guy, this old man, and I tell him, he's always saying, I mean, he's got this beautiful line, right? He, he's saying that, you know, uh, people talking about if they find the voice of their arrive. He's like, who want that? What's the point? Why you keep on doing this thing there? So speaking back to that, we just spoke about uh, Miles David and Jazz. And I mean, Paraga mentions this as well. I mean, Paraga mentions this when he speaks, for example, about, you know, the issue of jazz in, in, in uh, black music and blue people. That, I mean, the, the whole idea of jazz is to go against the standards. So that, like, you know, like, I mean, I mean, the idea of music is that is to, is to go against the standard, is to refuse the standard. You know, like, because when you find your voice, why should I read your next book or your third book or, book or your fourth book? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't see the point. You know. So, like, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that, uh, I mean, this guy is quoting, obviously, you know, um, um, our father here, the, the Afrofuturist, uh, uh, Sandra, saying that 
the idea of black music is to find your voice and kill it. So that you, you, you're trying to move away from the standard, you know? You kill the voice and find another one, like Miles was doing in his music. And people are criticizing all the time for that, that Miles you know, like, is always changing. He's always experimenting with new ideas. Can't be staying in one place, man, for 25 years. Um, Lona, one of our people here, Sonu Abile, says, if we're in an auditorium and there was no time constraint and no data involved, he'd ask you to read that again. So I don't know what we ought to do right now. You know, you've got a what do they call it? Special request on a popular demand, as they say in reggae. But let's humor him, please. Okay. I just try to say it. Nanny of the Maroons. Nanny. My womb was sealed with the molten wax of killer bees, for nothing should enter, nothing should leave. The state of perpetual siege, the condition of the warrior. From then, my whole body would quicken at the birthing of every one of my people's children. I was schooled in the green giving ways of the roots and vines, made accomplice to the healing acts of cheney root, fever grass, and vervine. When my breast flattened, settled on moving against my chest, my movements ran equal to the rhythms of the forest. I could sense and sift the footfall of men from the animals and smell danger death's odor in the wind shift. And when my eyes rendered light from the dark, my battle song opened into a solitaire's moan. I became most knowing and forever alone. And when my training was over, they circled my waist with pumpkin seeds and dried okra in a traveler's jigida and sold me to the traders, all my weapons within me. I was sent, tell that to history. And when your sorrow obscures the skies, other women like me will rise. Mike, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, truly. We're blessed. Um, you know, another way for us to to get out of here. I hope I hope people picked up on the issues that were thrown at them. Even though, of course, you know, time constraints, distance also, it would have been lovely for us to have been in one room and engaging. We could go on forever. But um, yeah. Um let us thank everybody who's who's um, who's tuned in and I just want to go out with just one little thing as a token of my appreciation of uh, of what that defining moment of our time as a people that that shattering that rupturing moment that um, took some from here through them elsewhere where they grew a seed a favored seed beautiful seed and now coming back to us so um, I'll, try, I'll try to read this slowly because there are people who accuse me of, of, of speaking too, too fast when actually they listen too slowly. But okay, preach their own. The mountain salmon, Solomonic bloodline, Shashamane landmine, explosion time, the heart stepping out in Eritrea. Voyage to the human interior ends where the race is inferior, brains gripped in hysterias, purification, purgation, cleansing conscience in fire to chill, heads buried in chests, searching for blackness's will to kill. They feed the Judaic lion still. 40 million in black skin became garbage thrown across the middle passage to a disinformation age. Intellect carnage made politician beautician, put cosmetics upon pillage, this global Potemkin village. Kevokian chalk line for the Cretaceous. Late affluence breeds avarice. It's a red distance to greenness. They impeach the wind for morning sickness, but between sound and sense, the sun rises. 
more than queen or whore, mother divine. Run down on a nocturnal salivation. Street dogs in salvation. We are distractions, children, under a disaster moon. Fevered breed senses in agitation. Beastification, the supplicants ruin. Whole cool the butchery scene in the control dungeon. Now revolution is a corporation. After the answer comes the question, this renaissance dead and rotten become novel conception, perfumed in regurgitation, where vomiting then eating in alternation, return to the monster's digestion. Now the flavor of the month is sweet and sour fried children. Power is muscle grip and flex session on television. Demon symphony, this liberation. These angels are promises, their wings broken. Screw face and skin teeth are here, head to tail, intertwined reptilian. Passion twins, they drown question. Pack the soul from here to celebration and still the wheel rolls in dry skin. Going down tenty, taking neck, main infertility night of bar and sun. No come on the stock market, mark, on the stock market floor. Please put the love rocket waste in your pocket. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope we'll stay on while we let other people go so we can have our own goodbye. Thanks a lot and good evening. Good night to everyone. Don't log us out, man. We, we still have to talk. Just the other people. Oh, uh, thanks so much for tuned in. Um, thanks to Curiosity Backpackers, to Ben Dube, to Bobby, um, Bobby Rodwell, to Mayo, 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 um, and to the speakers, Mr. Mohamed for the game. Lola, Goodson, Anati, Sasha, um, anyone that tuned in. So I um, hope you guys stay tuned for the next in dialogue with Sigalam Puli Gang. Um, you'll find us by chat Curiosity Africa on the Facebook page. Thank you. Shut them out. Oh my, that was so lovely. Oh really? I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, I'm, I'm well. I can die now. I don't care. I can't hear you. Where's the guy? We can't hear. It's not coming through. It's not coming through. Uh, okay. I think that's it. That's Are, we uh, okay. Are we on? Ah, okay. Are we on? Ah, okay. Okay, Lona, I think I can hear you now. Okay, Lona, I think yeah. I can hear you now. Okay, rude boy. How are you? You're doing well? You're behaving yourself? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. These people want to allow me to be me. <laughs> You're the ultimate <laughs> rude boy. <laughs> <laughs> Rude boy, yeah, rude boy. Oh. <laughs> oh, the first, the first time I heard you, the first time I saw you read, I heard, I just say, rude boy, run boy, king, rude boy. <laughs> yeah, rude boy. Rude boy, run boy, king. So, what, 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 okay, okay, now, now great. great. Um, um, Bobby has got your contact, contact details, details and said, right, so. First thing, I'll do well. Write to you, communicate to one or the other. other. So I've got, yes. I've got a few yeah, things, things I need to I say. Need to cool. cool. And right. then again. again. Thank you, babe. Thank you. All right. All right. Peace. 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 Respect. Respect. Nice All to meet time. you, Slash Out. Nice to meet you. Bye, Lovely bye. to meet you. Bye. 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 <laughs> bye bye, South okay, Africa. Cool, cool. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Bye bye. bye bye. I'm gonna go eat something. Yeah. I hung, I'm hungry. It's morning. <laughs> okay, mama. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Nice to meet you. You too. You too. You know, so everything that time I heard you, you sounded splendid. <laughs>